All right. All right. So while we have Jeff, welcome to Flow with the Grow. How are you doing today? I'm doing awesome. I'm feeling great. Yeah. Thanks for coming on and sharing all this wisdom and energy you're about to share with us. I'm so excited. I actually read, because you attached your book in with an email and I read most of it. I read all of it yesterday, except for the last chapter. Yeah, that one. And oh my gosh, I am telling you, I was not expecting this. I like to read, but I find that sometimes I'll read for a little bit and like my eyes get sleepy or like I'm just not really as into it. That's why I like to listen to things as I'm doing stuff. But with your book, it was so captivating the entire time. Like the way, like your words spoke to me and I could feel the energy behind the words like come through the book. And I just kept on reading until I could, until I like had to go do something. But yeah, so it was, it was amazing. I loved it. Fantastic. Well, I'm so glad to hear that. And that is exactly what I was trying to do in writing that book. Connect with with audience, people who dig it, people who get it, and and that spiritual charge in there as well. Yeah. Yes, I loved it. So I would first love if you could just talk more about like who you are, what you do, things like that, and also yes. how you got into doing what you do. Right. Who am I? It's the it's the age old question, right? <laughs> So I'm Jeff Lizewitz. I am a life coach in Seattle, Washington, specifically for what I call creatives of any flavor and heart-centered humans. So if you got a heartbeat, if you understand that there's more to this world than uh, you know, sort of what it may look like, you're, you know, we'll get along. <laughs> so where do I come from with all this? Well, when I was just a kid. Uh, I was sort of like the weird friendless kid, okay? And I went to summer camp many years, Camp Log and Twig in the heart of the Poconos in Pennsylvania, if anybody's around there. This was way back. I was a kid, I was about eight years old or so in the late 70s. And every day after, um, after the activities, after dinner, they had this thing called free play where kids could just kind of run amok, do whatever they wanted. But this one summer, there was an empty cabin. And one of the counselors, like a 20-year-old, brought up a big old drum kit, a 70s stereo, and a couple boxes of records. Okay, and this is when classic rock, as you know, was starting to really kick in. So this is Zeppelin and Tom Petty and Bowie and, you know, just like all that amazing stuff. So as a little kid, I'd kind of sit under this tree and just, just listen to this guy play drums in the cabin. You know, the sun was going down, the fireflies were coming out. And it was, you know, it was pretty awesome. I just sit there every night. And then one day this guy comes out of the cabin. He, was, he sees me over there. He's like, hey, you, hey, kid, come here. I'm like, what? And I go up there and he's like, do you want to come in and check this out? I'm like, yeah. So I go into this little cabin and, you know, with the drum set in the stereo, this guy cranks up the Who song, Won't Get Fooled Again. If you know that one, that is a major rock song. And this guy just bangs the hell out of the drums. And my little heart just explodes. I'm like, music is a thing. So it wasn't too much longer before I, uh, you know, announced to my parents, what do you want to do with your life? You know, rock star. <laughs> they were thrilled with that one, of course. Um, I did not make it to rock star, but I have had quite a career in the music biz as a music journalist for the biggest radio station, uh, breaking grunge music to the world here in Seattle. I won uh, Best Independent Electronic Artist in the World in 2000. That's pretty good. I've had thousands of placements on film and TV records, millions of spins on the streamers, all that kind of stuff. And I teach uh, songwriting at a college, which is also awesome. Besides that, my creativity is also into writing. As you know, I wrote the book, I wrote screenplays, I've made a film, a couple films actually, um, photography. So I'm all about that, but I'm also all about empowering people. I've always been like the sort of cheerleader type. And it wasn't until, you know, sort of recently, you know, in the last 10 or 15 years that I realized that life coaching is essentially a way to use that energy to help people up level their worlds in all kinds of ways. So I use 
all my experience, of course, plus the millions of books and things that I've read, the training and all this and that, and also something called NLP, Neuro Linguistic Repatterning, which is, you know, kind of a way to sort of like hack your subconscious, essentially, so that we can untangle the subconscious beliefs and identities that might be holding us back. So that is the nutshell of Jeff. Amazing. So much. And like, <clears throat> yeah, you just been through so, so much and like experienced a lot of different, like doing different things, especially within music and things like that. And I had a question come to mind. Um, do you have a, I don't know, like a favorite screenplay that you've done before or like a music for a movie? Like, is there one that is, was like, holy cow, that was amazing. Um, well, you know, uh, probably the coolest one. So you're, you're asking what I did for production. Is that yeah. music that I did for? Yeah. Um, probably the coolest one was I did this, uh, this piece for a James Bond marathon. So it was a commercial, you know, some TV station, some network was playing, you know, whatever, 20 James Bond movies over the month. So they hired me to make a, a piece that incorporated quotes from the James Bond movies into the music. You know, I'll have my drink shaken, not stirred. I don't play the odds. And, you know, I'm Bond, James Bond, all those kinds of things. And um, put it into the music. And they played that thing like probably tens of thousands of times, you know. Pretty that's cool. Really, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And I love James Bond, you know, the old James <laughs> Bond movie. So. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. How old were you when you got started with doing um, like more so the like, um, cause I know you, that story that you told, but then how old were you? I guess, I don't know if you said when you were, how old you were, you were when that started. When I was at the summer camp. Yeah. Yeah. I was probably, when that happened, I was probably like eight years old or something like that. Okay. That's right. And then how old were you when you got started with doing like the music and um, screenplay and things like that? Well, I started playing music when I was, you know, like a teenage derelict type. My parents are like, you got to get a hobby. I'm like, okay, I'll, I want to play guitar, but it has to be electric guitar, you know, like whatever. <laughs> so they got me this like piece of shit electric guitar and I was obsessed. And from there was writing songs and playing in bands and, you know, just like mm -hmm. just went crazy from there. Yeah. Awesome. What about, okay. So going back to the subconscious that term you use for the subconscious blocks non-linguistic mm -hmm. what is that again neuro-linguistic repatterning neuro-linguistic repatterning okay can you talk more about that and why do you think most people don't realize or know what that is or realize that they have subconscious blocks right so the way our psychology is set up is we are conscious of our conscious thoughts, right? Duh. Um, however, the subconscious actually controls most of what is going on in our lives, in our bodies, and in our choices. Subconscious patterns get instilled in us all the time, but, but largely in our youth. Okay, something happens and it kind of gets in there, it gets reinforced and before you know it, it's a pattern that you don't even know is happening. There's two major kinds of patterns. One is a belief about the world, okay? People could see the world as, it's a playground of joy and beauty. That's awesome, right? Sure. It, somebody else could see the world as a dangerous place that's out to get me. Not so good, not so helpful. What is the truth of that, the objective truth? Well, that's hard to say because we're all looking through a subjective filter, right? So somewhere in the middle is probably, you know, it's not a perfect world, clearly, and it's not a, you know, horrendous disaster, you know, complete horrendous disaster anyway. So we can find our place in there. So that's a belief. And we all have these uh, beliefs about the world, about all kinds of things. The other big one is, an identity or pieces of our identity. So those are beliefs that are essentially connected to ourselves, okay? So our identity might be, hey, I'm smart and good looking and capable. That's a pretty positive identity. 
or it could be eh, when things get hard, I kind of quit and I'm not, you know, I'm not smart enough or good looking enough or, you know, capable, whatever. So the world happens around us. Okay. That's the stimuli. It's the whole world is always happening. And all this kind of goes through our system and it goes into our subconscious and our subconscious plays out whatever is going on in the world through these beliefs and identities. Then you're going to make your choice and then you're going to have an outcome, right? So you can just see by that little system, which is happening constantly every single day, that when you have cleaner, more positive, more useful beliefs and identities, you're going to make better choices and then have better outcomes in your life. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think that's really powerful. Like once you learn about that and how you can overcome those blocks and then really get into like what knowing what's holding you back to help you, you know, press forward and do what you're like meant to do or what you want to do. Um, why are so few people living lives of purpose, connection, creativity? Good question. I think that is largely because we get it kind of smacked out of us or smushed out of us at an early age. So when we are young, I mean, you look at your basic kid and they're just like, ah, the world is cool and let's play and, you know, whatever, all that kind of stuff, right? That's awesome. However, as kids grow up, they start to become more self-aware and they start to see how their peers and their parents and teachers and everybody around them sort of, you know, acknowledges or feeds a piece of them or, or a, an, act, not an activity, but an action or kind of pushes it, pushes it down. Like you don't want to be the weird kid in school, right? Because then you feel ostracized. You feel like you're not part of the group and everybody wants to be part of the group. This keeps going, high school hits, good Lord. It's, you know, a thousand times worse, you know? And then, and then you got the media messages, you've got, you know, institutional messages, marketing, all these kinds of things smash into our heads a million times a day. And if you believe them, if you're not centered in yourself, you will, you will believe them and then you will lose that connection first to yourself, which is the most important by far, right? And then to the world, to your purpose, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why we have so many people running around, spinning around, like, what the hell's going on? Why am I even doing this life, right? Unfulfilled, unconnected, without, without that feeling of purpose. Yep. And I think that a lot of, and you talk about this in your book too, but like the fear aspect of things and starting before you're ready. And I love, I was taking notes throughout when I was reading it, but one thing that you said I'm trying to find it. We only get experience by doing things. And I love that because it like, it, I kind of was like a light bulb. Like, yeah, that's so true. We we're not fully ready because we haven't experienced that thing yet. So right. like, how do we know if it's going to work or not? Um, and so how have you helped people start before they're ready? Or like, kind of tell me more about like your concept with that. Yeah. Start before you're ready. So it's kind of a huge, it's kind of a huge idea. I'm glad you picked up on that. So what he said was, we don't have experience until we have experience, which is so obvious, right? But it, it's almost so obvious we forget this, okay? The only way to know what something really is, is to experience it, right? What humans love to do is sit, sit there in the chair somewhere and imagine things. And that's part of what makes humans so amazing. We can create the world. We create, we made the freaking iPhone. We made Zoom. I mean, somebody did, I don't know, right? Um, the problem is that imagination also turns into the dark side, right? We can imagine, we can fear anything. And the more we fear things, the, more, the less likely we are, we are to do them, even if the fear is completely you know, not true, right? So when you experience something, you can then accurately gauge whether or not this is a good idea. Now, I'm not saying, you know, there's a reason for fear, 
right? The fear keeps you from falling off the cliff. You know, you walk at the edge of the cliff, like don't walk, like that's a big risk. Don't do it, right? But we tend to, as humans in the modern world, overestimate the risk of many things in many ways. And that keeps us from doing things. So when I say start before you're ready, yeah, get prepared, right? To some extent, but you'll never be fully prepared for anything until you do the thing, get the credibility, learn from it, do it again, practice it. You know, it's like practicing the guitar. And then one day you'll be able to rock yeah. you know, on the guitar or whatever you're doing. Yeah, for sure. One thing that I've always kept in mind is that if I've never done something like, let's say podcasting, when I started that or tr personal training, I knew like I already was in the mindset that, okay, I might suck at this, but that's okay. Like I'm going to suck at this first so I can get better at it and yeah. learn from it. And you also talk about failure. And I like how you, you, the chapter was fail fast and you talked about failure, but then you also said overall, there really is no failure because we learn and we get feedback, like you said in the book. And I think that's really cool to just keep in mind is that we're not ever really, so then failure like really just doesn't exist. Like we get feedback, we learn, we try again and, and repeat, keep going. Exactly. I, I'm thinking about changing the title of that book based on your comment, suck first, fail fast. Yeah. <laughs> right? Because you are going like to suck that. first. Right? Yeah. Yes. Maybe you should do a book, you know? Okay. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, what you said there is totally true. We always suck first. How could you not suck first? right? Because we, we get better through practice, through repetition, through experience. You know, the first time, you know, the Rolling Stones played at a bar in London in the, in the early 60s, you know, I wasn't there, but I'm guessing they sucked, right? But they got better and they got better. And for, you know, decades, they've toured the world and captivated audiences. It's the same for any band. It's the same for anybody doing anything. Yep. Embrace so. the suck. Embrace the suck. I'm going to think about <laughs> making some t-shirts of that. Yes. That's awesome. Amazing. How did you, okay, when did you write the book and how did you, was there like a moment when you're like, hey, I need to write about this because of this? Like, how did it evolve from the beginning? Well, it was interesting. I, being a Seattleite here in Seattle, Washington, have spent many weekend mornings like overindulging in coffee and writing. <laughs> so I will write poems, journal entries, screenplays, whatever. So years ago, you know, before this book was, was a thing, I just wrote something, something life coachy. And I was like, huh, this ought to be a book. <laughs> so I just wrote the rest of it. And as I was writing it, um, the concept is really, I've experienced and learned so much through my travels. And I've banged my head against the wall so many times. There has been so much blood and so much failure. I mean, I'm serious. Like there's been way a lot of success, but there's been way more failure, right? And I'm like, can I'm I- I'm glad read you book? pointed that out. Yeah. And, and by the way, any- Every successful person in whatever field you ask them, what's your experience with failure? They will all tell you, I failed a million times before I succeeded. Mm -hmm. It's the only way to get there. Yep. Right? So my concept on this book was I, I want to write a book to help people bang their head against the wall a little less than I did. Right? From the internal struggles and the, the identities and all that kind of stuff we talked about to you know the tactics and the strategies like how are you gonna like get out there and like do this thing because you will experience failure so what are you gonna do with that right mm -hmm. a lot of people experience experience failure in fifth grade and they quit good point. Really? Mm -hmm. not a good plan you know they take the least resistance and all that so that's that's kind of where the book um came from Awesome. Can you tell us about a time where you felt you felt like you hit rock bottom, like one of the really lowest points and like how you like rose out of that? Ooh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you a couple of them. So 
one of my lifelong dreams had been getting a record deal. Okay, like getting a record deal is a big deal because that means a company is behind you pushing your music and the, you know, your chances of success increase like a million times. So in 2008, I made a record. Uh, my band is called Electron Love Theory. You can look that up in your uh, you know, streamer if you want. So I made an album of electronic versions of U2 songs, one of my favorite bands, with female singers. I love this thing. I put a lot of work into it. And I ended up getting three record deals, three different countries, US and over in Europe, right? I was like overjoyed. Oh my God, this is my dream coming true. You may recall 2008 was the year of the like financial collapse. Oops, two of these three companies went bankrupt and the other one completely botched it. I'm like, oh my God, you got to be kidding me. However, I got the rights to my music back and I put it out on, at that time, downloads and then streaming. And this thing has had well over a million plays, people all over the world, check this thing out, royalties coming in. It's just like, wow, from completely crushed to a That's win, awesome. like my music is out there. Nice. Another, another quick story on that, it, on the uh, you know, failure thing is as a screenwriter. So, you know, I've written all these screenplays, studied this, gone to LA, taking classes, you know, I'm like into it. And getting, so, so then the next step is getting someone to buy your screenplay, right? A, a producer to buy your screenplay. This is a big, big deal and very difficult um, because when they buy a screenplay, they're essentially investing not only into the screenplay, which can be quite a bit of money, but also millions into making the film. It's a big, big investment. So it's very difficult. So I got all kinds of bites for years and years and years, but nobody ever bought one. Finally, I said, fuck this. DIY. So DIY stands for do it yourself. It's punk rock ethos. I'm sort of part punk rocker. Um, it, it just means, you know, don't wait for the world, do the thing. So I scraped up some money. Um, I was like, oh, you know, I got a thousand bucks in my bank account. I'm going to make a film. So I made my film. However, it ended up costing many, many, many times more than I thought because, oops, you know, <laughs> what do I know about making films? I never made one before. Complete fail as far as the finance of that. So I got this thing done. I love it. It's called Mystic Coffee. And it's about a wise and magical barista. I said, actually, she kind of looks like you. <laughs> now, that I, now that I think about it. Um, awesome. So um, so I get this thing. So the next step when you make a film is put it into film festivals. So I send it out to all these film festivals and I get zero bites, complete fail again. I'm like, oh my God. Like, do I suck at this or what's up? A couple months later, out of the blue, I get a phone call from this woman and she's like, a friend of mine at a film festival sent me your film. I checked it out. It's awesome. We want to license it for international distribution. That's like three steps above winning a film festival. Wow. So I went from complete fail. I went from semi-fail to complete fail to even oh. more of a complete fail to a total win. That's amazing. What? Yeah. Yes. Especially exactly. like because you invested so much and like financially was not good, but then, then just one day you like it. This and if you would have never made that or you quit, then that would have never happened. And then you can connect right. the dots back afterwards and be like, okay, this is, this is actually good that I did this. Exactly. So you know, <laughs> like they say, the best time to plant a tree was twenty years ago right? Because it mm -hmm. grows over time, just like your experience grows. So if you're into making films, go make one. And now, by the way, it's so much cheaper. You got an iPhone, make a film. It's free. Yep. You yep. Know? Yep. For sure. Yeah. What's, um, so what's a challenge that you see a lot of your clients facing or struggling with? Sure. Well, um, one of the things that my clients struggle with is the comfort zone, Ta -da, ta -da, right? So the comfort zone 
it's it's a pretty good zone in some ways. Like comfort zone is comfortable and that's fine to be in the comfort zone. We need that sometimes. The problem is when we are in the comfort zone all the time because the comfort zone is great for comfort, but it's terrible for growth, right? You need to be uncomfortable to grow. So what I, you know, ways that we address this is what if you step a little bit out of the comfort zone, do something, say something, be something that is not comfortable, not, you know, not spending all this money making a movie or moving to New York and trying to get onto Broadway, just like a little thing. Okay. But here's the deal. When you stand there, you got to stay there. Stay there with the discomfort. You breathe it, you let it be. And guess what will happen? Miracle of coolness. The comfort zone actually expands to meet you. Ta-da. You just stepped out of the comfort zone and then you're back in it. If you're willing to stay there long enough, All right? You keep doing this in little ways and then in bigger ways on a regular basis. And guess what? Not only will your comfort zone expand, your, your entire life will expand. You're going to get much closer to the purpose and the connection and the meaning of your life. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. I love how you took this in small steps, like just having them do one thing that's like a small step to get out of your comfort zone. I've never thought about it like that before, but that's instead of it seeing the whole bigger picture of like, I got to make this massive change to get uncomfortable. Well, no, you just have to do one small thing to get uncomfortable just a little bit. And then that'll be your comfort zone. And then you do that again. Absolutely. So this like, you know, in your podcast, maybe the first one, instead of putting it out to the world, you know, you just make a recording with a friend, just interview mm -hmm. a friend. Like yep. it's a little weird. I've never done this before. Right. But it's your friend and it's not going anywhere. So who cares? Yeah. Right. But just feel that discomfort. Then maybe it's just interview with somebody, you know, acquaintance, mm -hmm. and then a stranger. And then like, okay, now we'll put this thing out. Yeah, for sure. You mentioned purpose, the word purpose. And um, I feel like a lot of people are like, well, I don't know my purpose or I don't know like, like what, do, what is purpose? How do we know what our purpose is? Do we have one? Do we have many? Can you talk more about that? Well, sure. I mean, I think we were multifaceted humans. We have many purposes in different areas of our lives, but purpose or the why, you know, the, the question why is what drives us. And if you don't understand and really know consciously what your why is, you will never be fully connected and energized through, through that knowing, okay? So it's really important to understand the why. So you simply ask yourself the question, why? Why do I wanna do this? Or why do I don't wanna do this even? We'll give you some information. But here's the check. The first answer is never going to be the accurate or full answer. Okay, I've done this kind of, these kinds of exercises with like a zillion people and it is never the first one. So once you get your first answer, then you ask the same question. Why, why this? Right? And you're going to get a deeper answer. Then you ask another question. Keep going. You keep going until you get something that suddenly feels like real truth. And when you know that, you are now tapped in to your core and able to energize that through your mind, through your body, through your heart, and then do shit, do the thing that you want to do, right? And then you will be you will be tuned in to the meaning and the purpose and the connection automatically mm -hmm. when you yeah. take those steps forward. Yep. Uh, yep. And asking more and more questions. And do you mean like asking the same question to get a different, deeper answer? Or is it more like different questions? It is the same question. It is why. The que it's a one word question. Just why. <laughs> why? Why? Why yeah. do, you know, why? You know, why do I want to do this thing? What, what am I here on earth to do? You know, mm -hmm. to make movies. Why? Well, because I like movies. Why do you like movies? Ah, I see. Because 
they tell stories that I can relate to. Why do you, why does that matter? Because it helps me feel less alone in the world. Why does that matter? Because I want to connect with the world and I want to share my stories with the world for others who may feel alone, right? Something like that. Yep. Yep. Okay. I love that. So you got to yeah. go down, 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 down. Once you get yep. to that, bam, that's when your heart shines. That's when you know who you are yep. and what your actions can be in the world. Yep. What does it mean to live your gift? That, <laughs> just that. what we talked about. Yeah. It, it's to go in deep, understand who you are, what drives you, what these, what the why is or whys are, and then having the courage to live your gift because we all have gifts, right? They're different, you know, whatever. It's to find it, to know it and step forward. And I'm not talking about, you know, necessarily a career path. This is what I'm gonna do all day. This is what I'm gonna do for money. Although if you can do that, that's fabulous, right? Because then you're essentially getting paid for what this is, what, you know, what this is true for you. And that will give you a very fulfilling life. You can also use this in other ways. You know, it can be a hobby. It can be a part-time, it can be a side hustle, those kinds of things. It can also be relational. Like I want to be a great dad because I had a great dad, right? Those yep. kinds of things. Yeah. Yep. Right. Or organizing groups, you know, do a meetup group of, you know, people who are into this kind of book or whatever, because that book means so much to you. Yeah. And I love how you said courage, like that word, if we just have courage, that's, that's a really powerful word. I feel like for people to just keep in mind, um, what about, okay. So going into your book, I want to talk about the title. How did you get to thinking about what the title is? Well, I wanted to use some F-bombs in there, by the way, the title. Is this thing on, are we on video here? Not yeah, effing around. <laughs> oh, okay. Just checking. Not effing around. The no bullshit guide for getting your creative dreams off the ground. I love the little guy character in that. And yeah, the little the guy, you know, he's like, best. yeah, rock on. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you know, kind of like a cartoon version of me. The type best. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, so the title came from observing some of the language that I was using. So one of the words that I, or phrases that I, you know, was saying at the time and still say, and probably was always saying was, I'm not fucking around with this. I'm not fucking around, right? I'm like, ah, oh, that's pretty good. And then I'm always into acronyms. So NFA, yeah, right, NFA. So I'm all about the NFA. And, you know, that was cool, but, you know, the subtitle just needed a little bit of a, a little of a boost to, uh, you know, focus it in so people know what the hell I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I, yeah, I thought that was really just pretty catchy. And then it, like, I connected with it and I like acronyms too. So like the NFA and I just thought, yeah, I thought it was genius. Thank you. I love yeah. it. I, I have people, you know, like all over the world emailing, emailing me and being like, I read your book. I'm, I'm so NFA. I'm getting into the NFA. You <laughs> yes. Know? Like, all right. NFA. <laughs> okay. Yep. I'm going to, yeah. It's something that people will remember forever. Like I'm going to remember that for the rest yep. of my life and everything that I do. <laughs> you, you can shout it out to your, uh, you know, your workout clients. Oh yeah. And uh, we're NFA today. Um, so in your book, you talk about, and actually this is the chapter that I didn't get to. So I'm excited to hear more about it, but you talk about the IC, I think it is. Yes. Yeah. The uh, IC properly pronounced is IC. ick. And the ick stands for the inner critic. Oh, Ooh. I love that. The super villain of the self, right? Yeah. The inner critic. So what is the inner critic and how does it affect us? Well, the inner critic is built into each of us and there is a reason for it to be there. The reason is essentially that to keep us safe, right? It's sort of like fear. It's an element of fear. So back in the day, way, way, way back in the day, we were all in tribes, right? Small tribes. And if you did things or said things 
that got you booted out of the tribe, you're going to die. There's basically no way to live as a solo human, right? So this kind of got developed within us. It's the critic that says, you know, the same kinds of messages. You can't do it. You're not smart enough. You're, you know, not pretty enough, not rich enough, like all the, all the things that we hear in our heads. So there is a reason for it to be there. However, it has been amplified so much in modern culture that it is largely, well, I wouldn't say it's not effective. It is effective. It's not, it, it, it's not useful, right? So there is a time to listen to it. Hey, you know, if you have a hundred bucks and this thing's going to cost $99, you know, maybe you're not rich enough to, you know, buy the thing to invest in it or whatever. Right. But very often we use the inner critic or the inner critic uses us to stop us from moving forward to starting before we're ready, you know, to sucking first and failing fast. Right. So you really got to watch out, especially when the inner critic gets subconscious. Like if you can hear the voice kind of in your head, at least you can sort of deal with it and maybe objectively, you know, try to work with it a little bit. But if you can't even hear it, that's when that's when it gets into the subconscious and the NLP stuff. So you really have to watch out for for the ick, right? And it has value, but it should. But if it controls you, is where it goes south. Mm -hmm. so you gotta watch out for that. Yeah. So it sounds like we gotta make sure we're aware of it first and. What, what would be like, what are, is there a couple of things that you would give your clients to help with the, the IC or to work through that? Sure. Um, one of the, one of the best tools that I use for that is I do guided meditations with electronic beats. Oh, amazing. Yeah. So, you know, you've probably done a bunch of guided meditations and, you know, some of them are good. A lot of them are crap, but some of them are good. But they, all of them, everyone that I've ever heard has like this sort of like washy music behind it, you know, and that's nice and relaxing. And I'm like, give me, yeah, give me some beat. So being an electronic music producer, I made some super chill beats, very hypnotic. And then I do all my guided meditations to the soundtrack and like a sort of spoken word, almost like hip hop -y, like, you know, kind of thing. So that's a little extra. So anyway, this, uh, this gets people way down deep to identify and start to see what's really true for them deep inside of them um, concerning their inner critic and other, other factors. And then we heal that. And the way to heal it, and this is, you know, I'd much rather do this with everybody than tell them how to do it because it'll be more effective. But, but the way to do it is to pull a very sneaky trick on your enemy of the ick. Right. And that is to genuinely love it for what it, how it serves you. When you, you know, the negativity that you put against that or any other internal force only amplifies it. Right. So instead, you shine love, big, true, genuine love onto the parts of you that hurt and thank them for their service because they're all the parts of you are in service to you right they just might be out of balance once you got that going the ick is going to just turn into putty basically and then you just, through the meditations and stuff you let the ick know thank you for your service i'm in charge i will let you know when this is necessary Wow. That's a, like a perspective that I've never like, just thought of or heard of before, like just to send love to your, to your ick and to your inner critic. And that makes me really want to go do that meditation. I'll do one with you. Oh yes. Right now? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I will do one with you if you want to do it. Yes, I do. I love, I'm, I've, meditated a long time ago and then I kind of stopped. I'm trying to get back into the practice of it, but yeah, I would 
love that. So, but that's, that's a really cool, just kind of shift in the mindset of, instead of like giving it the negativity over and over again to instead give it love. Um, yeah, I think that's really awesome. Where can find, what, where can people find the meditations and like your music too? Uh, the music you can find on any of your favorite streaming services, you know, Spotify and all the rest of them. It's called Electron Love Theory. If you want to uh, find the website, it's electron-love-theory. I'll tell you more of this and that kind of stuff. Um, the guided meditations, I only have a couple of them out there. And I don't believe I have the one that I just told you about. But it's on uh, Insight Timer, if you're familiar with that. Yes, yeah, so you can just look up my name and there's a couple of them there. Um, but really, the best way to do it is to do it live. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if people want to contact me um, through, through my website, we can. Oh, amazing. Yep. What about what's the what's the biggest thing that you've learned in your creative journey? Yes. So growing up, I was, you know, enamored by like the rock star and the top of the bestseller list and the blockbuster movie and, you know, fame and fortune as most people are, I think, um, especially when they're younger. However, what I learned after many fails and many successes in my creative endeavors is that at its best, creativity is a way for us to be seen, expressed, healed, and connected. So what am I talking about? So to be seen out there in the world, we are, I believe most people are very seldom seen for their true self. You're driving down the freeway or online, you know, nobody knows you, you know, your acquaintances, maybe people at work or something, they kind of know you, you know, but they probably don't really, and they probably don't really care. Then you got your, your real people, your friends, your family, your partners, whatever. And hopefully they see you and they get you. But in my experience, they don't get all of you or don't see the whole picture. So there's the scene part. What is expressed? To be expressed, in my definition, is simply to move from the potential to the actual. So think of a dancer on Saturday night. She knows all the moves, but she's sitting in the corner while that disco ball's rolling and the beats are pumping. She's not expressed in that moment. As soon as she gets out there and starts dancing, she's expressed, just like a poet. You can have a pile of poems on the desk well, that's great, but you're not expressed as a poet until you're actually doing some writing. So that's seen expressed. What about healed? To be healed through authentic creativity is, it's like a, it's a catharsis or a celebration, okay? Much creativity is a catharsis, a processing of experience and letting it go through the art, right? Whether it's dance or a song or whatever but it doesn't have to be something dark. It doesn't have to come from a dark place. It can also be a celebration. There's healing in a celebration. What's the celebration of a love song? It is the, um, you know, letting go of the loneliness that came before, right? I'm celebrating this love right now. So when we are seen, expressed and healed through our genuine uh, creativity, we then give that gift of creativity to the world. And when I say the world, I'm not talking about Madison Square Garden or something like that. I'm talking about even just one other person. When you give your gift of creativity to the world, you become the gift because you show others that they can be seen, expressed, healed, and connected. And that makes creatives and heart-centered humans into like a secret ninja army that is out there trying to get the world to cut the bullshit and like be true first to ourselves then to another then to the world amazing that was like that was so I don't know I feel like I need to go back and listen to that but that was such a cool perspective and um, yeah, I loved that a lot. And what kind of clients do you usually work with? Uh, any kind of creative, certainly. I mean, anything from, you know, I've got Canadian rock stars and Broadway violinists and, you know, things like this, but I've got um, 
you know, abstract painters and dancers. I've got a slam poet. I mean, it's just like all kinds of stuff, any creative and any kind of heart centered human. So, you know, if you've got a heartbeat and you can feel it, <laughs> essentially, that's who I would love to work with. That includes like small businesses and solopreneurs, right? People who are doing work, not just for money, right? We all have to make money, of course, but like, how about if we do something to really help the world in a way that, that matters? So all those kinds of people, but basically all that stuff. Awesome. And what's your approach? And so like, if someone wanted to work with you, what's kind of like your approach and process with that? Sure. So I've got, I kind of think of it in two ways. It's the outer world and the inner world. So the outer world is, you know, the strategies, the making the schedule, the, the tactics of moving forward and whatever the endeavor might be, right? You know, and if it's a business, you know, how to do social media properly, all these kinds of things. Um, and then we've got the internal world and the internal world is really where the action's at because that is all the stuff we talked about before, these beliefs and identities and what might be holding us back that we can't see. I've got a you know, sort of magical power where I can see this stuff very quickly um, with people. And oftentimes they are sort of shocked into the truth. <laughs> mm -hmm. make, maybe I'll make a chapter called that, shock into the truth. <laughs> <laughs> um, so by combining both the inner world and the outer world, depending where somebody is and where, you know, where we're going, that's basically how, how we work. And all of my clients, um, you know, at the end of our, our time together are like, I've had massive positive, you know, changes, oftentimes not even in the things that they came to me for. Well, that's, right? yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. And that's cool that you, you help with the external and the internal. I think the internal is super important and needs to be like, really worked on in order for the external to grow even more. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Do you do like Zooms with people then? Or is it, yeah, I'm yeah. assuming it's not like a course, but it's more like one-on-one -on -one Zooms? Yeah, yeah. It's one-on-one -on -one Zooms. I got people all over the world. So cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I, I do classes and things sometimes. Um, not, but it's not, I don't do the recorded videos and things like that. It's yeah. not really appropriate for what I do. I, I want to go in deep one-on-one -on -one or small groups. Yeah. Oh, very cool. So uh, kind of wrapping this up, is there anything else that you wanted to make sure that you shared or wanted people to make sure that they heard and took away from today? Um, yeah. Sophia is freaking awesome. That's obvious. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Jeff your is listeners, freaking awesome too. <laughs> your, your listeners figured that out already, but I just thought I'd say it again. <laughs> um, no, amazing. I mean, that's, I, I've spoken plenty. That's yeah, I, mean. I, this has been amazing. Um, one, I do have one last question, actually. Yeah. Um, so my podcast is called Flow with the Grow. When you see that, hear that, what comes to mind for you? Uh, like like an awesome jam and bass line. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that all right? <laughs> yes. Everyone has such different answers too. And I like, there's never been one that's the same. Mm. It's very cool. Yeah. I love it. It's a great name. So if someone wants to reach out to you, they want to know all mm -hmm. the things they want to work with you, where can they go? Where can they find you? You can find a ton of blog posts, sign up for a, you know, complimentary session, all this kind of stuff on my website, jefflizowitz.com. You got to be able to spell Lizowitz or at least get close to it, but it's L-E-I-S like Sam, A-W-I-T-Z. And hopefully you'll, you're going to have a link or something on your somewhere. For sure. Under the, in the show notes, there'll be a yeah, link to notes. the website. Yep. Okay, cool. Beautiful. Yeah. I would love to talk to all you guys listening. Cool. Yeah. Um, well, same. Not all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone <laughs> else. <laughs> 
Well, um, I'm so appreciative of you and thank you for your time and for reaching out to me to sh like share your wisdom and insight and everything. You're just, you're an amazing human. I'm so, so glad that we connected. And also something that you said in your book was the universe, basically the universe quiet, quietly conspires to bring you the people and places and situations that will serve your highest good. Something along those lines. Exactly. And yeah, I, that I totally agree with that. And I feel like this, that happened with meeting you. And so I'm very grateful. I am grateful too. You're an amazing podcaster and host and human Thank as you. well. So <laughs> we're on the same team. Heck yes. Heck yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, I will chat with you soon, I'm sure. And I hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Yep. Bye.